Hello and welcome to today's Bible study. I'm Mike McDonald and we are doing an in-depth word by word study of God's Word. We are here at the Arella, an active senior apartment complex located at 12840 Jones Road, Houston, Texas. We meet here each Wednesday at 11 o'clock on the second floor in the faith room. If you are ever in the area uh, at that time, please feel free to come by and join us. You will be welcome. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm Mike McDonald. We are in a Bible study in Houston, Texas at the Arella on Jones Road. Uh, the Bible study has gotten us to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, so uh, it took us a while to get out of chapter 11, but I think we're out of it. And we're starting chapter 12, and it is uh, going to be interesting. Uh, before we get started, remember, if you're a believer that Jesus Christ is your Savior, then God the Holy Spirit has permanently indwelt you. And He will help you understand Scripture if you have no unconfessed sin in your life. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, you are what Scripture says, you're out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You've taken back control of your own fellowship and you've taken it away from Him. And He will not violate your will on that. So with no unconfessed sin in your life, He will be at liberty to help you understand Scripture. So silently to God the Father, confess all known sins since your last confession. If you are not a believer that Jesus Christ is your Savior, then confession of sin is totally irrelevant. Uh, the only thing relevant to you in Scripture is believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior. So let's go to God the Father now and do that. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you thankful for this opportunity to proclaim your word, thankful for your word, thankful for this group of believers who gathered together wanting to learn more about your word. We ask, Father, that you help us understand it and apply it to our lives, that we may better represent you today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're going to uh, get started on the doctrine of biblical per perspective of the doctrine of tongues. A very, very controversial doctrine. Uh, and I will pass these out uh, even though it is going to be a distraction for this next lesson. <laughs> But I encourage you, uh, when you leave here, to find some time to uh, look all of these verses up and go over this. Because, and you're going to have to go over it more than once. Giving a homework. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to go over it more than once or... Uh, uh, it's going to be uh, a blur. <clears throat> but we are going to go straight into, since I introduced tongues last week, we're going to go straight into verse 1 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 1 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren... I do not want you to be unaware. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, New American Standard version of that. Um, just so we start out right, the, the word gifts, in, if it's in your scripture, 
it's probably either in parentheses or it's in uh, italics. Uh, that means it's not in the original language. But what is in the original language is pneumaticos. Uh, that is uh, spiritual matters or spiritualities. Uh, and spiritual gifts is a good representation of that because that's what we're talking about. And he says, I do not wish you to be uh, unaware. Well, what he really says is, I do not wish you to be ignorant. Um, and anytime you have that in Scripture, you know who he's talking to is unaware uh, of that particular subject. So the word spiritual uh, is pneumaticon, spiritualities. The word gifts is not there, but that's, that's what we're going to end up talking about. Spiritualities, uh, the, uh, the word gift, okay, uh, sort of does appear when we get to verse 4. Uh, but there it's, uh, it's even more special uh, or significant. So spiritualities is here in contrast to what we've been talking about in chapter 11. That's why he's got it, spiritualities. It's in exact contrast of carnalities. Uh, that's what all of chapter 11 is about, is, is these probably the most carnal believers that you will find in Scripture or in Houston uh, were these in, uh, in 1 Corinthians. So in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul referred to these same believers as carnal, even babies in Christ. Now he's going into something in direct uh, contrast to that. These carnalities had to do with divisions in the church, had to do with wranglings about different leaders in the church, had to do with adultery, had to do with going to court against fellow believers, had to do with the way women dressed, had to do with the, the length of men's hair, had to do with the love feast and gluttony and drunkenness. These are the carnalities that are now in contrast to what these spiritualities are going to be that we're going to get into. All of that was carnality. And we still find that in the church today, uh, believe it or not. I'm sure you do believe it. Uh, same problems still exist. Uh, the section on carnalities was corrective. He was trying to correct all of that. The section that we're beginning now on spiritualities is actually constructive. We're, we're going to try to build something out of that. And he is still talking to fellow believers. Adelphoi, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Remember what I've told you about the word uh, agnoin. Agnoin is the word no knowledge. Uh, knowledge with the alpha negative in front of it means you have no knowledge. So nobody that's up walking around has no knowledge. All right. So when you, when you have the word agnoe in, in a sentence, you know it's specific about some subject. And the subject that he's talking about here is uh, spiritualities. No one is absent of all knowledge. So agnoin must refer to something specific. Verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols, however you were led. That's kind of a confusing sentence, okay? Uh, and it's, uh, it's even confusing to uh, the Greek scholars who translated it. So, so you know that when you were pagans, all right, you know is our verb, oidate, it's a perfect active indicative. It is, it, uh, this is something that you know, this is a fact that you know, uh, and this is something you have known, you knew it in the past, and you still know it, okay? Pagans is actually the word for nations, ethne. Uh, it's either translated Gentiles or nations, here is, is pagans, uh, it's translated pagans less than either one of those other two. So uh, basically it means you, when you were non-Hebrews, all right? And this is, a, this is an indication to us that the, 
majority of the believers in Corinth at that time were not Jews. There were Jews there. The Jews probably are the ones that started it, the, uh, the, the Jews that believed in Jesus. Uh, but the majority of, apparently were uh, non-Jews, non-Hebrews. Uh, and he is, he is going back to them because when they were that con in that condition, he's, he's, he's uh, actually referring to unbelievers when you were an unbeliever. Uh, and he's talking about that is because they were um, worshiping idols. It is used in the singular of the Jews uh, very rarely uh, in Luke chapter 7, verse 5, and in John chapter 11, verse 48. It's used of Israel as a nation uh, in the plural. So, you were... Uh, Ete, action in progress in the past. So this is non-completed action in the past, uh, and that's what he's referring to. It is reality. It's indicative mood. Action done by the subject, so they're the ones that are doing it. You were led astray to the dumb idols. Okay. Uh, Paul is reminding them of their recent history. He, uh, they obviously remember their recent history, He's reminding them because this is going to be significant. Uh, they knew this. Uh, uh, they used to worship things that they had just finished making. And then they would turn around and worship those things. <clears throat> uh, but he's also pointing out to them, and that's why the double you were led uh, in the English, I'm sure, He's pointing out to them that not only that they did this, and they did this voluntarily, but something else was involved in leading them astray. And he's already told them what that is. Uh, earlier in chapter 10, verse 20, when he says, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, talking about the, the animals that the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. So when they're, you're going into a... A place that has that you're worshiping an idol it is a dumb statue that is made with human hands but what's the power behind that statue is a demon every time at least one Paul's already told him that okay so you were as in italics that means it's not in the original Greek however uh, I really don't understand why uh, this is significant, uh, and I told myself I wasn't going to bring it up, but I just did. Uh, um, it says you were is not is in italics and it's not in the Greek. Well, it it really is in the Greek because uh, let's see, hegeste is the imperfect passive indicative, and it translates you plural were led. Uh, it doesn't mean that you were. You were, it means you were led somewhere. So that word is there. Action in progress in the past, reality. Action happened to the subjects. Uh, and then it says, however you were led. Uh, and that, that's a participle, present passive participle. Uh, that is uh, also a, a verb. Uh, let's see. You were nations, you were led, you were being led away in a moral sense. So this is, this is what he's referring to. You were led to these idols, and then you were led away in a moral sense because of these idols. Uh, and that is a uh, big long word, apogno, uh, It's even longer than those, okay. So this, this is from the verb agnoa, and it means to lead away, uh, to execution. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little added to the meaning of the word. Not only were you led away, you were led away. When, it's, when he's used in other forms other than this, you were led away to be executed. Uh, so it's also used to that. It is here used in the moral sense. Remember, they were being led by voiceless meaningless idols that had demons behind them in their power. So Paul apparently believed 
that some of the Corinthians' problems were due not entirely to their worldly attitudes, which we had in, in chapter 3, but also to the presence of false teachers in the church. So, and these teachers uh, were leading them away, trying to uh, get them to think well of the teachers. And since most of them had come out of idolatry, uh, they had absolutely no background to fight that kind of stuff. The, back, the pagan background that they had come out of uh, didn't help, and we covered some of that background in chapter 8, verse 10, and chapter 10, verse 14, uh, and verses 20 and 21. Okay, verse 3. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says... Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. All right, that verse has really been messed up. Uh, so, to begin with, let's, let's look at the, the word curse. Uh, anathema. Okay, a curse, a cursed thing. Prop properly a devoting of the, to the vengeance of the infernal goddesses. This is the way that word was used when Paul wrote it. It is distinguished from anathema, uh, and they're, they're written almost identically. Uh, one, of them, it's, uh, one of them has the... Uh, one form of the the uh, letter E in it, and one of them has the other form, and and it makes a completely different thing. So, uh, distinguished from anathema, uh, it's a, an offering dedicated, hung up in the temple by a worshiper of a god in return for a favor received from that god. And the reason Paul is talking about this. Uh, turn to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 5. Luke, chapter 21, verse 5. And you will remember this, this scene, okay? Um, then some, then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay? This is when Jesus is uh, coming back coming out of the temple and they're talking about how wonderful the temple is and he says this that, the, that this temple's going to be destroyed the, way, the reason I bring it up is because he's pointing out things that are there right? These stones and donations in the uh, New King James the words donations, what do y'all have? Offerings. Offerings okay, well what that word is in the Greek, is anathema. So in the Jewish temple at that time, they had offerings hanging in the temple that were brought there by Jews, because only Jews could get in there, male Jews, uh, brought there by Jews, and these offerings were to demons in the temple. And these people were saying, this is in return for the favor that this demon did for me. That's anathema is an offering dedicated, hung up in a temple by a worshiper of a foreign god in return for a favor that that person thinks he received. That's where it's used. That's why Paul's uh, talking about what he's talking about here. So this kind of stuff was going on uh, in Jerusalem at that time. All right, so... Yeah. 
I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I wouldn't think so because Paul has to tell them so many times that there are demons behind this. This, this statue of a, of a cloud or a dog or an, a lion is not what you're worshiping. What you're worshiping is a demon behind that. So, uh, so uh, with this statement, Paul marks out the clear... No, we're back to the, back to the verse I had to go off there. Therefore I make known to you that no one, all right? Uh, with this statement, Paul is marking out the clear-cut dividing line between Christianity and every system of religion of man. With this statement, Christianity exalts Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what Christianity does. The other systems deny His Lordship and think of Him as a cursed one. Accursed. All of the other systems do. All right? Islam recognizes Jesus Christ to be, a, to a certain extent, as a prophet of God, but sees Him as the accursed one because He claimed to be God. Uh, well, how does that sound with Judaism? So also with every pagan system, even Judaism also sees Him as one who falsely claimed to be the Messiah and has counted Him as an accursed one. If the religious system knows anything about Jesus, has ever heard anything about Jesus, they think of Him as accursed because He claimed to be God. Christianity is the only one that doesn't do that. So, therefore I make known to you that no one, uh, speaking by the Spirit of God, says Jesus is accursed. So, do not misunderstand this statement. It is saying that when you hear someone say that Jesus is accursed, okay, when you hear someone say that, that person is not being led by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not saying that nobody can say that. It's saying that if this person, and that's just what was happening in this church, if this person is standing up in front of you saying he's representing the Holy Spirit and he's representing uh, God the Father, and he says to you that Jesus is accursed, he is not being led by the Holy Spirit. That's what this is saying. The false teachers in Corinth were obviously claiming that their visions and their revelations and their messages uh, were from God. And we'll get to that again in 2 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians didn't do it. He had to write them again. Uh, and that, remember, as I told you, uh, 1 Corinthians is the second letter that he's written to these people. Uh, 2 Corinthians would be at least the third. Uh, so... Uh, they, let's see, th these people uh, who said that they were getting these revelations from God denied the humanity of Christ. They didn't deny His deity. They denied His humanity. Okay? Uh, and, th and this is what, that's called doceta. Let's see, dos, docetism. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Docetism. Uh, deny that Jesus was human. Well, what that amounts to, uh, they believe that He was divine, but that He was not human, and His sufferings, when He paid the penalty for our sins, His sufferings and death on the cross was just pretend. That He really didn't suffer on the cross because He was divine. Uh, but He was not human. Okay? Um, the Apostle Paul, I mean the Apostle John, uh, even though Paul had to deal with it twice, and the Apostle John also had to deal with this in 1 John chapter 4. It, it's still going on. And he still has, and it's still going on today. They, they, people don't. There are probably very few believers uh, that understand what the doctrine of the hypostatic union is and even fewer that understand what the doctrine of kenosis is. That Jesus didn't empty Himself of, uh, of His divine attributes, 
when he went to the cross, he voluntarily refused to use them. He still had them, but he voluntarily refused to use them. Uh, and there are even fewer believers who understand that. So accursed, anathema is a cursed thing, properly a devoting of the vengeance. Okay, I went over that. Uh, this is distinguished from anathema, uh, and we did that. So, uh, let's see. And no one is able to say, Lord Jesus, except by the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is, this is a, another one uh, that's uh, kind of hard to, to get, and you won't get it unless somebody breaks down the, the Greek for you. Uh, n no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, obviously, anybody can say Jesus is Lord, right? Uh, uh, and this says flatly, no one can say that. But the word that, uh, that we have here is from the verb lego. Uh, and remember, I, I told you there was a difference in lego and rhema. Lego has something to do with the, the entire speech that's being given. Uh, rhema has something to do in, most specifically with just the individual words that are in that speech. Well, lego also has... Uh, the idea that the person talking, the person making that speech, actually believes the message in the, in the speech. And that's what Paul is saying here, is that uh, he can't believe that, all right? He's, he doesn't believe, he can't do that except by the Holy Spirit. So to say, uh, let's see, let's see, no one, no one can say, the verb to say, uh, is apen, and it is from Lego. Characteristic of Lego is that it implies uh, to believe the claim or claim to believe the meaning of the statement. So it is by the Holy Spirit that we recognize that we need a Savior. He's the only one that can convince uh, a uh, unbeliever that he needs a Savior. Remember, an unbeliever doesn't have a human spirit uh, that's working, all right? Uh, as soon as you, God breathed the breath of life into you, when you were born, your human spirit is separated from God. It's dead, okay? So the Holy Spirit is necessary for an unbeliever to even uh, understand this message. It is by the Holy Spirit that we recognize that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, uh, we, through our, through our free will, can refuse to believe that, and the majority of the people do, but uh, He will not violate our free will. The Holy Spirit will not force us to believe. It is also through the Holy Spirit that we learn Bible doctrine. We don't learn it any other way. So after we become believers, after we become believers... The Holy Spirit, through Bible doctrine, remember we covered this last week, precept upon precept, that's principle upon principle, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, that's the way you learn Bible doctrine. If you don't learn it that way, then you are t at a total disadvantage of, a, of getting it all together and putting it in the right place in your system of doctrine. So... Uh, that's the only way you, that the Holy Spirit will teach us that Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, He is also our Lord. That's why it is impossible for a person to accept Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. You have to accept Him as your Savior first, and then you have to learn Bible doctrine that you are able to present Him to yourself as your Lord. Most believers do not act like Jesus is their Lord. Most believers don't even believe that Jesus is their Lord. They haven't learned enough doctrine to do that yet. That's why it's so misleading when, when pastors get up and present the plan of salvation and say, to an unbeliever, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
You can't do that as an unbeliever. You can learn that He is your Lord. You can accept Him as your Savior because you know you're lost. All right? All right. So, uh, the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to teach us that Jesus is not only our Savior, but He is our Lord. We can also refuse to believe that. That's our free will. We can refuse to believe that Jesus is our Lord. All right? We can refuse to act like Jesus is our Lord. Uh, he is your Lord, and it, but He's not going to force it on you. He's not going to force you to change your activities. Uh, if you believe that He is your Savior, you're saved. All right? uh, if you don't believe that He is your Lord, you're still saved. Okay. Uh, we can also refuse to believe that. In fact, most believers today do not believe that and do not act like they believe that. However, once you believe that Jesus Christ is the anointed Savior from God, that's the gospel, He is your Savior and your Lord. You're not accepting Him as your Lord does something. It doesn't cancel your salvation. But it limits what the Holy Spirit can do with you while you are still here. It limits His activity. It limits His... It, he refuses to work through you. Okay? So that you end up living all of that time here on earth as a believer without ever having done anything worth uh, being rewarded for without, without ever earning any kind of uh, praise from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus. What the Holy Spirit will do through you he is limited on earth and it limits your future rewards in heaven. But it does nothing to your salvation. All it does is limit what the Holy Spirit will allow uh, to happen through you. Okay, He will not work through you as a believer uh, if you're out of fellowship. Uh, now there are, verse 4. Uh, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Okay? Now remember, when Paul is writing this epistle, we're talking about uh, circa A.D. 56. All right, that's when he's writing this. Pentecost occurred around A.D. 30 or 33. So it's uh, the gift of tongues. Okay, remember Pentecost was when the, uh, we've all, all learned for a long time now, Pentecost was when the church age began. That's when Jesus Christ had been resurrected, He had been accepted into heaven, and He had been seated at the right hand of the Father. So He is not only ascended, He has started His session as Lord, all right? seated at the right hand of the Father. So now the Holy Spirit can be delivered to earth. And that happened at Pentecost. The church age began. Well, something else began at that time also. Not only did that, that was a, a, a beginning of the church age so that God the Father can deal with humanity in different ways than He was dealing with humanity before. That's what happens when a dispensation changes. All right, so we have uh, the church age beginning. We also have tongues showing up for the first time all right, at Pentecost. They showed up as tongues on fire above the heads of the disciples. Okay, that was the sign. Uh, the sign, the gift, um, this prophecy of tongues it was a prophecy. Well, who, who's going to know prophecy? The Jews who read the Scriptures and believed the Scriptures. They're the ones that are going to know the prophecy. So the tongues was prophecy for believing Jews. It was also a sign but it was not a sign for believing Jews. The sign is for unbelieving Jews. The unbelieving Jews also knew the Scripture, but they had refused to believe that Jesus is their Savior. They were still waiting on a Savior, but they knew this Scripture. 
and God knew that was going to happen. <laughs> so the sign of tongues was for the unbelieving Jews. And the sign was that judgment is coming on your nation because of your failure uh, to act right. All right. Judgment is coming on your nation. Uh, they didn't know how long that judgment was going to be, but they knew that that was the sign judgment was coming. Okay. The sign or the gift would last until what happened, what, what it was signaling actually happened. Well, that happened, what, we're talking about 30 and 70, 40 years later. That happened 40 years later. So that sign was a sign for unbelieving Jews for 40 years. And 40 years after that came, Jerusalem was flattened out. And every Jew in the nation, Israel, was scattered all over the Roman Empire. And they still are scattered all over the world. All right? We have Jews back in the homeland, but they are unbelieving Jews to the most part. And we still have Jews all over the world. So Paul is telling them how they are to make use of a legitimate spiritual gift when he's writing this. When he's writing this, it's just been... Uh, Israel hadn't, I mean, the, the temple hadn't fallen yet uh, when he's writing Corinthians. Let's see, when, when was Corinthians written? 1 Corinthians. Oh, I just told you that, AD 56. Okay, so, so uh, they're, still, they're still taking uh, uh, sacrifices to the temple. The, the, the temple was still standing. That's where uh, they, they had gifts to foreign gods hanging in the temple. Uh, so it's still going on. Um, and the sign is continuing. So now we're here. Uh, and the gift of tongues is here. And, Paul, and it's already being misused. It's already being misunderstood. Uh, and he's, go he's going to try to tell them how they can legitimately use this legitimate gift to spread the gospel and what it's for. Now there are varieties of gifts. The first word here is diaparesis. Uh, literally, it's uh, to, ta to take asunder. Uh, we have it as a variety. Uh, well, when you break that down, it means to take apart, to take asunder. So there are a variety of gifts. Gifts is the word charismaton, charismatos. Um, and that word is not for gifts. That's, that word is graces. These are graces that are given. Earlier we had, uh, no, this, this one is charis. Earlier we had pneumaticos, and we had that as gifts. That wasn't gifts either. That's spiritualities. Uh, but it, it, he's going to end up talking about the spiritual gift of tongues. So it's perfectly all right. So now we, we have the, the word gifts, uh, and it's not in italics, even because this is uh, uh, spiritual graces would be a legitimate thing. When Actually, it's just graces. This describes the God-given equipment. This is a spiritual gift. This is... And the definition of a spiritual gift, God-given equipment for God-given task. It's just that simple. God-given equipment for God-given task. Well, God-given equipment is only given to believers. Only believers have spiritual gifts. They are supernatural endowments that enable believers to carry out God's work. They are legitimate. They are still legitimate. Okay, spiritual gifts, we still have spiritual gifts. Uh, they are special abilities. Uh, they are the Father's organized witness to grace and salvation in the church age. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4. Some people try to make this word apply to only the gift of tongues. All right? Spiritual gifts. Uh, and... The reason that 
they try to do that is because of the word charismaton. Uh, and they get the word charismatic from that. And charismatic is one of those words that every time you hear it in the society today, you, you immediately think of the gift of tongues because that's what's publicized so much. Uh, and they, they speak of the charismatic movement. The word applies to all spiritual gifts, all right? Graces. The Holy Spirit gives only to believers. And He gives at least one spiritual gift to every believer. And that has happened since Pentecost. The initial distribution of spiritual gifts was not done by the Holy Spirit. The initial distribution was done by Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, when Jesus Christ ascended out of hell, he led captivity captive. He brought all the Old Testament believers out of there and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So Jesus Christ is the first one to distribute spiritual gifts. All right. Then subsequent to that, after that event, they are distributed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, during the church age, it is done by God the Holy Spirit, and He sovereignly, that means nobody questions Him, He sovereignly gives at least one spiritual gift to every believer as a member of the royal family of God. Did you know you were royalty? You are royalty. You are a member, adopted member of the royal family of God. All right? And He treats you that way. Who else would He let approach Him anytime, anywhere about any subject? And all you have to do is pray to God the Father and you are immediately being listened to. You're immediately being heard by God the Father. Who else? Um, yeah, okay. That's royalty. Uh, uh, let's see now. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. We'll get some more into that next uh, maybe next week. Okay, so what we have here is, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit. He is equal with God. He is equal with God the Father. He is equal with God the Son. They all three have exactly the same divine attributes. He, the Holy Spirit, sovereignly gives the spiritual gifts to believers the very instant you are born again. Our gifts do not depend on our abilities. He doesn't pick us out and say, well, you're a great speaker so I'm going to give you the gift of evangelism or I'm going to give you the gift of oratory. He's, he doesn't do that. He gives them the way He wants to give them, sovereignly. Doesn't depend on our ability. Doesn't depend on our morality at all. Christianity doesn't either. Uh, doesn't depend on your morality. Doesn't depend on talent or achievement. They are sovereign decisions by the Holy Spirit and we don't really know how He does that. And no, he hasn't told anybody why he does what he does. He just does it. The same Spirit is the theme that we will be stressing throughout this section, and it will last through chapter 14. In verse 3, Paul referred to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All in verse, in verse 3. Now, in reverse order, okay, he's going to stress the unity of the Godhead in relation to to the different spiritual gifts, okay? And that's what we will get into next week. All right, so we'll start out at verse 5. Uh, any questions? 
Right. So his question is, since the gifts are sovereignly bestowed by the Holy Spirit, do we make decisions uh, for people's position and responsibility based on what we think their gifts are? And the answer is we should do that, uh, but we don't always do that. I mean, uh, uh, we, don't alway, we don't always, or it's not always apparent what somebody's spiritual gift is. Remember, we can refuse to have, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, as our Lord. And He's not going to force it on us. We can also, even though we have a spiritual gift, be aware of that spiritual gift and refuse to use it. He's not going to make us use it. If we do choose to use it, He will definitely uh, help us be successful at it. But He's not going to force us to use a spiritual gift we don't want to use. Okay? We have the ability to determine what one's spiritual gift is. Uh, do we have the ability to determine uh, what our spiritual gift is or what somebody else's. Uh, personally, I don't think we actually are given the ability to even know what our own spiritual gift is, much less what somebody else's is. Uh, so uh, that, that well, may how not... Do we use it? Yeah, how do we use it? Uh, well, we use it by learning doctrine. The Through the Holy Spirit, you learn doctrine uh, and you've eventually learn uh, what you're successful at and if what in the Bible, in the Bible? by studying the Bible by, yeah learning doctrine uh, studying the Bible generally you, you're you not going to be able to um, uh, and, and don't get this wrong all scripture is for our, our understanding all scripture is given and we are expected to be able to learn it alright uh, but we are expected to learn the, the sources available to us. Uh, you, you, you're not going to sit down and read the Bible and learn much uh, until you learn how to read the Bible. Uh, the most significant uh, thing that I think you can learn in Scripture after becoming a believer is that there is such a thing as dispensations. And God treats humanity differently in different dispensations. And with each successive dispensation, humanity is given more to do and more revelation about God. That's why uh, we can't do uh, in this dispensation what they could do in previous dispensations. That's why Job could sacrifice to God the Father in, in, uh, on behalf of His children who weren't even there because He was the uh, male adult fam of the family uh, and He was the spiritual leader of the family and He could do that. We can't do that. We can't sacrifice, period. Uh, any animals to God, though, although that was a legitimate way because Christ hadn't died at that time. So uh, we don't necessarily, um, I have never been told what my spiritual gift is. No, I haven't got any idea what it is. Uh, I hope it has something to do with teaching the Bible. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't gotten any special messages from the Lord about that. So, so all of y'all are still responsible for verifying everything I tell you. If you can't verify what I'm telling you in Scripture, then write it off, okay? Because that's that's where the that's where the deal is. Anything else? I uh, that's probably would would qualify, but I don't think that's what Paul's talking about right now. He's talking about people who are in the church, who are leaders in the church, and who, who are respected leaders in the church, and they're getting up telling you that Jesus is accursed because he's not, he's not the Son of God. He says he was, but he wasn't. That's, and that's what they're dealing with. 
And, and what Paul is saying is nobody who is being led by the Holy Spirit can say that. If he can say that, he's not being led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you and you had you had demons actually performing miracles in front of people, uh, and if you if you didn't have a, uh, a, a background in scripture, uh, you could easily be led astray. And these all of these people, or most of these people, came out of idolatry to begin with. Anything else? Okay, gracious Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Father, we ask that you help us apply this to our lives that we might better represent you this week. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, to study God's Word. Our hope is that you will join us next week for the continuation of this. If you are not sure where you will spend eternity, you can be sure. Uh, God has provided a way for you to be with Him. He loves you. He has done all the work. Uh, all we have to do is believe Him. Uh, His Word tells us certain truths. Number one, you or we are sinners. The penalty for sin is death. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place for our sins. He has done that. Your sins are paid for. If you believe that, then you have eternal life. You don't have to do anything physically. You don't have to ask for anything. You don't have to pray anything. All you have to do is believe that information. The Gospel of John chapter 3 verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. All we have to do is believe the information. Thank you.